Hello and welcome to WHO's uh, virtual press conference uh, on uh, COVID-19, Ukraine and other global health issues and a special focus today on ACT Accelerator. We have several uh, special guests that Dr. Tedros will introduce shortly, but let me introduce to you uh, our experts who are in the, in the room. Dr. Tedros Adanom Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director, Health Emergencies Program, Dr. Maria von Verkerkov, Technical Lead on COVID-19, uh, Dr. Bruce Elward, Senior Advisor to the Director General and the Lead on Act Accelerator, Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director, Immunization Vaccines and Biologicals, Dr. Sosefo, Assistant Director General, Emergency Response, Dr. Regiero Gaspar, Director, Regulation and Pre-Qualification. Um, as, um, as you know, this uh, press conference is uh, in different languages, the six UN languages plus Portuguese and uh, Hindi. Uh, now, without further delay, I would like to hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Dr. Tedros, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I will start by introducing our guests, uh, Dr. Seth Berkeley, CEO of Gavi, Dr. Philip Dunetten, who is in the room with us, Executive Director of Unit Aid, and Dr. Bill Rodriguez, uh, CEO of FIND, and also Dr. Ioan Pablo Uribe, the Global Director for Health, Nutrition, and Population at the World Bank. So welcome to our uh, guests. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for, for joining. Uh, over the weekend, WHO released an update about cases of acute hepatitis of unknown origin among children. So far, at least 169 cases of acute hepatitis have been reported from 11 countries in Europe and in the United States in children aged from one month to 16 years. 17 children, about 10% of the reported cases, have required liver transplants, and one death has been reported. The symptoms include abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting, jaundice, severe acute hepatitis, and increased levels of liver enzymes. The viruses that commonly cause acute viral hepatitis have not been detected in any of these cases. Adenovirus has been detected in at least 74 cases, and this and other hypotheses are being explored. WHO is working closely with the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control and the affected countries to support ongoing investigations, including additional lab testing. Also, over the weekend, health authorities in the Democratic Republic of the Congo declared an outbreak of Ebola after a case was confirmed in Bandaka, a city in the northwestern Equator province of DRC. A second case was confirmed today in a relative of the first patient. Unfortunately, both patients have died. WHO is supporting the government to scale up testing, contact tracing, and public health measures. Stockpiles of Ebola vaccines in Goma and Kinshasa are now being transported to Bandaka so that vaccination can start. The government and people of the DRC have a great deal of experience stopping Ebola outbreaks, and WHO will support them to do whatever is needed. Now to COVID. Globally, reported cases and deaths continue to decline, which is very encouraging and good news. Last week, just over 15,000 deaths were reported to WHO, the lowest weekly total since March 2020. This is a very welcome trend, but it's one that we must welcome with some caution. As many countries reduce testing, WHO is receiving less and less information about transmission and sequencing. This makes us increasingly blind to patterns of transmission and evolution. But this virus won't go away just because countries stop looking for it. It's still spreading, it's still changing, and it's still killing. 
the threat of a dangerous new variant remains very real. And although deaths are declining, we still don't understand the long-term consequences of infection in those who survive. When it comes to a deadly virus, ignorance is not bliss. WHO continues to call on all countries to maintain surveillance. Last week, I had the honor to visit Nepal and to discuss the impact of the pandemic with Prime Minister Sherbadur Duba and President Bandari. I saw how WHO, with WHO support, Nepal has established genome sequencing in its national public health lab, which will be key to identifying potential variants of SARS-CoV-2 as well as future pathogens. I also had the honor of witnessing Nepal's first typhoid vaccination campaign. Nepal's constitution says that basic health care is a fundamental right of every citizen, and it was a privilege to see that right in action, to meet the children who were vaccinated, their families, and the amazing health workers, and my appreciation also to Gavi and partners. It was a great reminder of the power of vaccines to save lives from COVID-19 and many other deadly diseases, including measles, meningitis, Ebola, polio, and more. This week is World Immunization Week, an opportunity to highlight the incredible power of vaccines, not just to save lives, but in the words of this year's theme, to offer the opportunity of a long life for all. But around the world, the pandemic has caused severe disruptions to routine immunization programs, putting millions of children's lives at risk and opening the door to fresh outbreaks of measles and polio. One of WHO's priorities supporting countries to conduct catch-up campaigns to protect as many children as possible and as fast as possible in partnership with Gavi. Last week, I also had the honor of visiting India where I met with Prime Minister Narendra Modi. I also inaugurated the WHO Global Center for Traditional Medicine with Prime Minister Modi, which will help to harness the power of science to strengthen the evidence base for traditional medicine. Both Nepal and India are getting closer to vaccinating 70% of their populations against COVID-19 by the middle of the year. And they're also rolling out boosters to the most vulnerable. As a result, both countries are now seeing a decoupling between cases and deaths. This is the level of vaccination we need to see in all countries. Almost 60% of the world's population has now completed a primary course of vaccination, but only 11% of the population of low-income countries. Closing this gap remains essential to ending the pandemic as a global health emergency. And it's not just vaccines. On Friday, WHO recommended the antiviral combination Nitra Matrelvir and Ritonavir, also known as Paxlovid, for patients with mild or moderate COVID-19 that are at high risk of hospitalization. This treatment helps prevent hospitalizations and easy to administer. However, Several challenges are limiting its impact. It's largely not available in the vast majority of low- and middle-income countries and requires prompt and accurate testing before administration within five days of symptom onset. This is compounded by a lack of price transparency in bilateral deals made by the producer. The persistent global gaps in access to tests, vaccines, and treatments highlight why the ACT Accelerator remains crucial to the global response to COVID-19. This week marks the second anniversary of the ACT Accelerator. This unique partnership of governments, global health agencies, civil society, and industry has many achievements to be proud of, as outlined in the ACT Accelerator two-year impact report, which was published today. Together, we have enabled 40 countries to begin their COVID-19 vaccination campaigns we have helped to build the sequencing capacity in Southern Africa that first detected the Omicron variant. And we have negotiated unprecedented deals with the world's largest oxygen suppliers to increase access in more than 120 low- and middle-income countries. In October last year, the ACT Accelerator launched a new strategic plan 
and budget and yet halfway through its current budget cycle just over 10 percent has been funded the pandemic is not over and neither is the work of the act accelerator we recognize that we live in a world with multiple overlapping crises and multiple demands for funding governments can find plenty of money for tools that take lives we call on all countries to invest in tools that save lives i'm pleased that the ne next month united states president joe biden will hold a global covid-19 summit with world leaders to maintain the high level attention that this ongoing pandemic deserves it will take all countries regardless of income level to commit to steps that can bring the pandemic to an end and in equities save lives prevent suffering and help get economies back on track today we are honored to be joined by leaders from four key partners in the act accelerator representing each pillar whom I have introduced earlier. I will repeat again Dr. Seth Berkeley, CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, who will speak on behalf of COVAX, the vaccines pillar. Dr. Philip Dunetten, Executive Director of Unit Aid, on behalf of the Therapeutics Pillar. Dr. Bill Rodriguez, CEO of FIND, on behalf of the Diagnostics Pillar. And Dr. Yuan Pablo Uribe, the Global Director for Health, Nutrition and Population at the World Bank, on behalf of the health systems and response connector. Thank you all for joining us and thank you all for your partnership and leadership over the past two years. Seth, let's start with you and you have the floor. Um, thank you, Dr. Tedros, for inviting me here today. I remember two years ago when COVAX and the ACT Accelerator were formally established. At the time, we knew the world was entering a pandemic, which turned out to be the like of which had not been seen for 100 years. We also knew that there were no known vaccines and likely would not be for any um, uh, or for some time. Uh, most importantly, we knew if we didn't come up with a plan fast, then as soon as those vaccines were developed, they would only go to rich countries with others waiting at the back of the line. That is the challenge that COVAX was set up to solve in the ACT Accelerator to accelerate vaccine development and ensure that vulnerable people everywhere would be able to access life-saving vaccines. Today, with over 1.9 billion doses allocated and 1.4 billion doses delivered to date, it's the largest and most complex global vaccine rollout in history. But where does that leave us today? The short answer is we have plenty to do. The science has been breathtaking, and we have more than a dozen vaccines, with many more coming. Um, currently, 44% of people in lower-income countries have now been vaccinated with at least two doses. Given that the global coverage is 59%, the global vaccine equity gap is narrowing, but it's still too wide. There are billions of people who have not been vaccinated. What's more, there remain some low-income countries, which you mentioned, 18 at last count, that still have protected 10% or less of their populations. The good news is that today we have access to as much supply as countries need to meet their national targets. That means that countries in turn can plan large scale rollouts with confidence that the doses they have requested will arrive on time, including usually with their product of choice. But we cannot ignore the fact that many countries' health systems lack the capacity to simply switch on massive vaccination programs alongside the other vital routine immunization services. To address this, Gavi has already made $600 million in COVID delivery support available to lower income countries, money that can be used to help cover the cost of infrastructure, hire new vaccinators, or work with communities. We've also stood up an enhanced COVID vaccine delivery partnership to enhance delivery support for the 34 lowest coverage countries. And we're grateful to our donors, thanks to whom we raised a further 600 million earlier this month. The pandemic is far from over. Until now, we've seen a new variant emerge every four to five months. This means that while we may have enough doses today, we need to be able to move swiftly should the need arise to buy more or different vaccines in the future. 
Again, here, I'd like to thank our donors who on April 8th at the AMC Summit stepped up and helped us launch, but haven't yet fully funded our pandemic vaccine pool, a contingent financing facility that will help us ensure that when the need arises, COVAX can step up and order new doses immediately. This is in stark contrast to 2020 when we first had to raise cash before we could place any orders, and it's a sign of how far we have come as a multilateral solution, not just in helping address the challenges of this pandemic, but leaving us better prepared for the next one. Working together is the only way to go. Dr. Tedros, back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seth. Um, and Felipe, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, and uh, good afternoon for everybody in the call. So I'm talking from the therapeutics pillar, uh, which means uh, it's a UNITED, Welcome, WHO, Global Fund, UNICEF, and some of our organizations, including civil society. Um, I will make uh, three points. What we have achieved uh, so far over the last two years, um, the progress we've made and the challenge we see. On the first point, I think that it has been um, a long journey over the last two years to find uh, the right medicine that works. And the first one was, uh, if you remember, um, access to oxygen. I think Dr. Teros, you made the point that it's quite important and it's life-saving uh, combined with uh, corticoid. And I think that a lot of work has been put uh, to review all the clinical trials, in particular with uh, WHO and Wellcome, to make sure that we have the evidence to know what is working. The um, second one, where we are as an outcome, and Dr. Zos made uh, the point that uh, we have now uh, the drugs and the evidence that uh, WHO has recommended, in particular the product Paxlovid from uh, Pfizer. Um, we have uh, for outpatient oral therapeutic five drugs, in fact two drugs uh, oral and three uh, IV, but uh, the Paxlovid is the one uh, who, is, uh, who has the most um, efficient uh, impact uh, with a decrease of 85% of the hospitalization and um, mortality for people at risk, and I think it's quite important to flag that because it's uh, not recommended for the old people with COVID, but really for the people at risk. It means in terms of age, in terms of uh, comorbidity, uh, diabetes in particular, but also uh, immunocompromised patients, including people living with HIV. So I think um, now uh, the challenge we see, uh, one point is the predictability of the, the pandemic. And I think that we, it's fair to say that even if the good news is that we have a reduced number of cases, uh, we need to be very cautious and be ready to deploy for the people in need. Um, the second issue, and I think Bill will, will come back on that, is the level of testing, because we need to have a test before uh, putting people under treatment. And this is a challenge, because if country don't, don't test, it will be difficult to have access to this therapeutic for, again, the people at risk. So uh, we also need uh, to have a good uh, term and ag agreement with the manufacturers, uh, Pfizer, based on the volume, the, the number, the countries that also will benefit from generic version of this compound. Uh, hopefully at the end of the year, beginning of next year. So it's a big challenge. We have uh, the, the company who has agreed already to, uh, to grant a voluntary license to the medicine patent pool with 35 manufacturers that can do generic version in the coming month. But um, we need also to uh, have funding. Uh, initially, uh, the global fund will be uh, with the will support uh, access in countries, but uh, we need to have additional 2.3 uh, billion, uh, 1.3 for access to therapeutic, 
and focusing on procurement and also preparing the ground for the generic manufacturers. And second, to increase access to oxygen because it's still uh, important uh, for all the people in countries to have access to oxygen, not only for COVID, by the way, but also for other priorities. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Philippe. And uh, Bill, uh, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, and good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Um, when I was in medical training some years ago, our program director had a set of sayings that he used to help us understand the challenges of providing high quality healthcare. And two of his favorite sayings were, our motto should be constant improvement without change. And number two was, we never make the same mistake eight times. So we would laugh when he would say this, but over time, as you work in global health and you engage in the hard work of, of changing health systems, you, become, you come to realize quite painfully the wisdom in those sayings and how hard it is to sustain change and to keep doing the right thing. And I've thought about those sayings quite a bit recently as I reflect on the trajectory of the pandemic and the two-year anniversary of Act A. Uh, certainly, as Dr. Tedros and Seth and Philippe have discussed about vaccines and about treatment, we have seen tremendous advances in the way testing has been used throughout this pandemic to diagnose COVID, to strengthen testing systems, to strengthen surveillance systems, and to link testing to public health and medical interventions. Through ACT A, there have been a number of, of headline accomplishments with which everyone is familiar. Prices for PCR and rapid tests have dropped dramatically through the ACT A Diagnostics Consortium and the Global Fund's C19RM by 70 to 80 percent. WHO has endorsed the use of self-tests for COVID on a global basis, and that puts the power of testing into people's hands everywhere, not just in wealthy countries. And those tests are available globally at prices of a dollar to a dollar fifty per test. The global capacity for genomic sequencing and the systems to track new variants has advanced by leaps and bounds to the point where we now routinely see new variants identified first in Botswana and South Africa before similar laboratories can identify them in Europe, the US, and in Asia. And after a slow start, global manufacturing capacity for diagnostic tests now exceeds demand. And belatedly but critically, we've made major investments in local diagnostics manufacturing facilities in Brazil, in Senegal, in South Africa, and in India, similar to what we've seen for local production of vaccines. And these manufacturing resources in the global south will be even more essential in a post-COVID world. So the tragic irony is here today on the second anniversary of Act A, we have never been in a stronger position as far as diagnostic testing programs. We've never been more capable of responding to the need for low cost, accurate, rapid tests required to manage a global threat than we are with COVID, not for HIV, not for TB, not even for malaria, and certainly not for diabetes or cervical cancer or neglected diseases. We've never had the degree of cooperation, the commitment, the policies, the tests, the manufacturing capacity, the integrated systems, procurement mechanisms, the trained workforce, the variety of community and hospital and laboratory-based tools and strategies to have unprecedented daily monitoring of a disease and its spread. And yet in the last four months in the midst of Omicron, as cities in East Asia go on lockdown, as vaccination rates stall, testing rates have plummeted by 70 to 90% worldwide. So we have an unprecedented ability to know what is happening. And yet today, because testing has been the first casualty of a global decision to let down our guard, we're becoming blind to what is happening with this virus. As Philippe noted, that undermines our ability to treat COVID with new therapeutics. And as Dr. Tedro said, this virus will not go away just because we stop looking for it. So let me end with, with one thought. I see three paths ahead. One is the acute phase of the pandemic is over and we can mourn our losses and we can congratulate ourselves on what we were able to protect. But that path seems pretty unlikely to me. Two is the pandemic continues to spread in waves across the world. And rather than learn again the lesson that shutting down testing programs prematurely is always a mistake, it always costs more money in the end, it always costs more lives, 
we make that same mistake that we've made so many times in the course of the pandemic, and we have a strategy that's based on hope rather than a strategy based on data. And so third, and this is my hope, we learn from the past and through the ACT Accelerator, we continue to invest in testing. We track the spread of COVID until all needless deaths are averted and we have fully contained this virus. Otherwise, we may come together again in six months and at another press conference, I might open my remarks again with a story about a saying that I once used to laugh about that we never make the same mistake eight times. So on behalf of the ACT A diagnostics pillar, I have faith that we can still learn and respond and test. And I certainly hope that will be the future. Thank you very much. And I'll hand it back over to you, Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Yuan, over to you. Dr. Tedros, thanks so much. And good morning, good evening to everybody. I'm very happy to, to be part um, of, of this press conference. The, the World Bank is um, an engaged partner of the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, ACTI. We're very happy to see its second year birthday with all what has been done uh, thanks to its efforts. Together with the Global Fund and with WHO, we co-convene the ACT Accelerator Health Systems and Response Connector, what we call the fourth pillar, which aims to get countries the necessary technical, operational, and financial resources to translate COVID-19 tools into national response interventions to stop the transmission of the virus and to save lives. The Global Financing Facility for Women, Adolescents, and Children, GFF, and UNICEF also support the work of the Health Systems and Response Connector. The focus of the Health Systems and Response Connector is in supporting countries strengthen their health systems so that these COVID-19 tools that we've heard from the prior colleagues can be deployed and reach those who need them within the health systems. Health systems are the foundation for the deployment of vaccines as well as of other countermeasures. At the same time, health systems have been disrupted by the pandemic and we can see how today, even two years after the pandemic, more than two thirds of the health systems in countries are still reporting report disruptions to essential health services, in particular affecting the most vulnerable, women, children among them. The Health Systems and Response Connector, in addition to addressing these challenges, also covers the personal protective equipment, what we call PPE, needs in countries, fundamental to protect essential health workers. This means providing protective equipment to more than 2.7 million health care workers, including the community health workers who play such a vital role in our country's systems. The World Bank's COVID and vaccine financing which is now reaching over $12 billion is complementary to this work of the Health Systems and Response Connector and to the whole effort done by Act A. We are financing support to purchase and deploy vaccines, to strengthen health systems, to train health workers, to reach out to communities with proper communication, to develop tracking systems, and to strengthen the cold chain, just to mention some of them. And we're also working with COVAX in an innovative financing mechanism that allows countries to purchase vaccines as needed as well. We will continue this engagement in Act A and the complementarity of our efforts with our funding, working with other colleagues in the Health Systems and Response Connector to ensure that these countermeasures reach the countries that still need them and that as a consequence, we not only save lives, but also strengthen health systems for future responses and for addressing future health needs. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Tedros, over to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Johan, and my thanks once again to all of you and to all our ACT, uh, ACT partners. I assure you of WHO's continued commitment 
to working with you to expand access to all the tools needed to bring this pandemic under control. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Fadila. Back to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tedros. Uh, let me now open the floor to question from members of the media. To get into the queue to ask questions, you need to, ra to raise your hand using the raise your hand icon. And do not forget, please, to unmute yourself when it is time. Let's start with Nina Larson from Agence France Presse. Nina, can you hear me? Yes, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask a question about something other than the ACT Accelerator, but um, I wanted to ask you about um, the announcement that Elon Musk is buying Twitter, uh, because I'm wondering if you are concerned um, that Twitter being run by a self-declared free speech absolutist could possibly run counter to your efforts to battle the so-called uh, infodemic and could possibly allow more misinformation about vaccines, et cetera, to spread. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Ryan to take this <clears throat> question. Um, well, I, I, I don't think there's uh, much to say. I think the, the point made at the end of your question is always an issue for WHO, and that is to, to try and ensure that we and our partner agencies, including all our ACT partners, get the best possible information to people. People do well, uh, and people make good decisions when they get good information. That's our experience. Um, <clears throat> there is misinformation and disinformation out there all across the whatever platform you wish to go to. Good stewardship of those platforms is extremely important. It's not the business of WHO who owns or who manages those platforms. What we do ask is that everyone, and many of the platforms that exist today have worked very, very closely with WHO. I don't know, Gabby, anyone wants to make a comment on that, but I know many of the social media platforms have really engaged with WHO and partners to try and improve the quality of information out there. We really have created a new science of infodemiology we work extremely closely uh, with our communities to try and pass the best possible information. But uh, certainly, we, when anybody takes on a new task, when anyone reaches a position in life where they have so much potential influence over the way information is shared with communities, takes on a huge responsibility. And we wish Mr. Musk luck with his, with his endeavours to, to, to improve the quality of information that we all receive. That is, in cases like this pandemic, good information is life-saving. Uh, it's even as life-saving and in some cases more life-saving than having a vaccine in the sense that uh, bad information sends you to some very, very bad places. Dr. O'Brien? Yeah, let me just amplify a couple of things that, uh, that Mike said. I agree with, uh, with everything he said. I think the issue that um, really is just so central is that people's lives um, are lost as a result of um, misinformation or intentional uh, incorrect information. Um, so it's just incredibly critical on, uh, on, the, on vaccines and on other health issues um, that people are seeking uh, credible information, they're getting their information from credible sources, and that uh, people are only passing on information uh, that, is, that is accurate um, and, uh, and reflects the truth about, um, the, first of all, the diseases and the um, life-saving interventions that are available. Um, so this is not just a, a matter of, uh, of, you know, chatter on, on uh, social media channels. It really has an impact on what people do, what they choose to do, what they choose to do for themselves, for their children, for their families. Um, so it's something we take really seriously. And I think we also have to recognize that for the vast majority of people, um, they understand the value of vaccines in particular. They understand the risks, uh, the frankly life-threatening risks of the diseases against which we have life-saving vaccines um, and are seeking vaccines and, and, uh, and getting vaccinated. So it really is a, a small group of people, a minority of people um, who uh, are, are engaging in um, uh, any, certainly any deliberate misinformation, but it, it cycles out to, uh, to many people who are having difficulty um, distinguishing between what, what's accurate information and what's not accurate information. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, next uh, journalist is Sarah uh, Jarving from DEVEX. Sarah, can you hear me? 
Yes, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering how concerned you are that the Ebola outbreak is in an urban area. Thank you. Sarah, can you just repeat the question? Your uh, voice was very soft. Dr. Sose? Um, thank you, Fadela. Ebola is always a concern for WHO and member states, although we have made progress over the last years in terms of the capacity to detect the diseases, like in Congo, where after less than 24 hours, the confirmation of sequencing was done. And we have also built capacity of vaccination and treatment, but uh, knowing the, you know, how deadly the disease can be, we are always concerned when it happens. It is always concerning when it happens in an urban area like Bandaka with the density of the population, but also with the risk of spreading across the river to countries like Central African Republic and uh, Congo. Republic of Congo, Brazzaville. So, so that's why we are working very closely with the national authorities in Congo and also our partners to mobilize the community for active care search in the community, but also some retrospective analysis of the health information data in the health facilities to be sure that we are not missing any chain of transmission. So this is concerning, but taking into account the capacity build and experience in Congo, we believe that it can be contained. But any outbreak, every outbreak is unique. You cannot just assume that because you have de dealt with Ebola outbreak in the same area before, you can't do the same thing. We need to make sure that the initial investigation is well done, identifying all possible sources of transmission and uh, all possible chain of transmission to contain it as soon as possible. Thank you. And if I could just supplement, because I think uh, uh, Bill mentioned this before in his intervention, how, how much we're moving on and what the prospects are for even greater control of diseases like Ebola or COVID. I mean, the fact that this virus was sequenced literally within 24, 48 hours, that we understood that this virus wasn't coming from uh, a relapsed case, but but with a, a new origin of the virus. The fact that vaccines have been pre-positioned, and this virus was uh, diagnosed on the, the reported on the 23rd of April. Ring vaccination operations will begin, I think, today. Uh, so say. So again, the speed at which we're able to detect, the speed at which we're able to react, the pre-positioning of supplies, the ability to have Ebola vaccine where Ebola happens, and where Ebola is likely to do most damage and amplify. Uh, and not have these vaccines stored under a mountain somewhere in an industrialized country, but actually have vaccines in the countries where these viruses strike. I think we are making progress, uh, and this demonstrates this. But as, as, as Sose so correctly says, uh, there is always the risk, and certainly in Mandaka is right there on the Congo River. It is very connected to Kinshasa. So being alert and being vigilant in the face of this virus, while at the same time using and, and exploiting the, the new technologies uh, and the, the greater level of surveillance. And again, uh, our co to our colleagues at the Ministry of Health and, and also uh, to Dr. Moyembe and others, uh, they deserve huge credit for sustaining the surveillance of Ebola, for expanding the use of uh, sequencing and for having uh, diagnostics again on site uh, and available now for, for making those diagnoses. What is concerning about this outbreak again is again we have two health workers, I believe, so say uh, uh, at least one of the workers. One of the workers is a health worker, and again we see uh, the the tragedy of health workers being, in a sense, the sentinel event that uh, someone coming to a hospital is sick, not diagnosed at the hospital level, and it's the death or illness in a health worker. So while we are making progress on some of the bigger issues, we are definitely definitely struggling with the very straightforward issue of infection prevention and control in staff protection and in managing infections within the hospital environment and still potentially allowing these diseases to amplify, even though there were very, very simple, straightforward 
uh, health systems approaches to be able to deal with that. So again, protecting our frontline workers, once more an area where we, we tend to fall down. And uh, at some point, we have got to take the issue of infection prevention and control within the healthcare system much more seriously, or we always risk amplifications occurring like this. Uh, thank you. Next uh, uh, question is for Emma Farge, Reuters. Emma? Good afternoon. Um, Reuters just published a um, exclusive saying that the EU has decided to move away from the emergency phase of the COVID pandemic. Um, would you be able to react to that, please? And since Mr. Yurabi is here, I would love just a few details on the size of the Pandemic Preparedness Fund and how you see WHO's role in it. Thanks. Um, well, we haven't seen that, I don't believe, uh, as of yet. Um, uh, but I think the DG's uh, uh, speech uh, said it all, and I think also Bill alluded to that. It, it, this is not the time for us to uh, lose focus uh, on this virus, nor on its potential to continue to evolve, nor on the fact that it's still killing people all over, on the, all over the world, and nor on the fact that we're losing sight of the virus because we're reducing the amount of testing that we're doing. So uh, we will look and await the report that you refer to, and we will read it with, with great interest. Uh, the European uh, Union, in general, has, uh, has, uh, takes a very measured approach to these collective threats, uh, and I'm sure that uh, the, any decision they made is going to be based on good science and good data. Uh, everyone is aware uh, and anxious to move on from the pandemic. Nobody more than us, I can assure you, would like to see the back end of this pandemic. But uh, the reality uh, is that uh, you, 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 you have a right uh, everyone has a right to their own opinion as to whether uh, this pandemic is over or not. But what you don't have is a right to the fact. And the fact is that this pandemic is still raging. Uh, you can have an opinion as to how we should react and respond to that. But the fact is that we're, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not out of this yet. Bruce, do you want to speak? I was just going to uh, jump in and add on that, and I, I agree uh, with, with what Mike has said there. And if we actually look at the information that we received, as the DG has said, you know, we are seeing some positive trends, and certainly we are seeing positive trends in the reduction in deaths around the world. Um, and I have confidence in that in terms of the reports of hospitalization, the reports of deaths around the world, but I have little confidence in the numbers of cases being reported around the world. Um, the sheer fact that we have had massive changes in testing strategies, huge reductions in the numbers of tests being used around the world, we have very little confidence in what we are actually seeing in the, tr in the trends in terms of cases. So on the positive side, we do see a change. We're in a different phase of this pandemic, certainly, um, but we are still very much in the middle of this pandemic. And this is still a global problem when we have huge numbers of uh, people who are dying that are dying unnecessarily. And the lack of our ability to track this virus, to better understand the trends, to monitor the variants of concern that we are aware of. And as you know, Omicron is dominant worldwide. We are tracking sublineages of Omicron, sister lineages of Omicron, BA.4, BA.5, BA.2.12.1. This will continue. Um, and the uncertainty that we have about what the next variant will be um, remains a significant cause of concern for us because we need to plan for many different types of scenarios. Um, again, on the positive side, we have tools that save people's lives, but we need to use those tools strategically and appropriately. Vaccines are saving lives, but they are only saving in lives in the people that they reach, consistently across high-income, low-income, middle-income countries. Those who are dying are individuals who do not have access or have refused vaccines have refused to be vaccinated, do not have access to diagnostics, do not have access to clinical care. And we can change that. We can change the course of this pandemic, and we must. Um, it is our responsibility to, to continue to be vigilant on this. And we also recognize the sheer fatigue that everybody feels in wanting to not talk about this anymore in the face of so many other challenges that exist. But again, this is our responsibility to ensure that there is vigilance for this particular virus because of the threat of variants, because of the threat for post-COVID-19 condition or long COVID, which we are just learning about, really starting to understand. Um, and we really need to use the systems that have been put in place and enhanced for COVID-19 for this current threat 
as well as the threats we just talked about with Ebola and with other infectious diseases that are circulating. Now is not the time to retreat. Now is the time to really strengthen what we have put in place um, and ensure that we keep people alive and we get our economies back on track and we save people's livelihoods. Uh, Fidela, can I just come back on the, I've just read the, the headers on this story. Uh, this is entirely consistent with WHO's position and what the European Union are, are actually publishing. They're speaking to a sustainable mode of control of the virus. They're talking about sentinel events, which WHO has already had it, multiple meetings on, and how do we shift to a sustainable uh, sentinel-based surveillance system with comprehensive collection of data. So uh, the European Union also states that moving back to more emergency measures is also a contingency that they have in place. So I believe this is very consistent with WHO's strategic preparedness response and uh, 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 plan, uh, and uh, this is a matter of words, but the, 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 the reality is there's nothing that I'm seeing here that's inconsistent with any of the positions that the WHO has. Uh, thank you. Um, I believe there was a question for Dr. Uribe. Do you want to take it, Dr. Uribe? Yes, of course. And, and thanks, thanks so much for the question and, and for the, the space to answer it. Um, we, we've all learned throughout these two years that there is some urgent needed capacity at the global, regional, and local levels to better respond to pandemic preparedness in the future. Um, we, we need to strengthen this capacity of preventing, um, responding to future health emergency challenges. Uh, and many independent reviews have highlighted the need to further invest in such capacities. So together with WHO and with the support of the G7 and G20, among others, uh, we're all advancing and looking for these additional resources that may in the future again have all of us better prepared to confront new challenges. We don't know the size of such additional financing. It will depend on the consensus and the effort of donor countries uh, coming around this very important public health need. We do need those additional resources and they should be additional, not just a redistribution of existing resources as this is an unfunded area in a great extent. We also need to know that those resources are needed sustained through time. It's not a, a quick investment or a one-time investment. It has to be a sustained investment in the core functions of pandemic preparedness and response, again, at those levels, local, national, regional, and global, in order to really be prepared. And we also want those resources to work around a stronger global architecture and not fragmented, as many have pointed out. I think those are guiding principles where we are all um, in agreement. So hopefully, again, there's gonna be a consensus building around these guiding principles, and more important, the purpose of strengthening in the future, our capacity to respond to health emergencies. Thank you, Dr. Oribe. Uh, let's go now to the next reporter, Soko Koyama from NHK. Soko, can you hear me? Hello, Fadila. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, uh, please. Okay, th thank, thank you for taking my question. Uh, regarding the reports of acute hepatitis of unknown origin, which Dr. Tedros just briefly uh, mentioned earlier, um, could you provide an update on what we actually know so far? and what general public should worry about. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Soko. I would like to invite one of our experts, Dr. Philippa Esterbrook, who is uh, joining us online to take this question. Philippa, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the question. I think it's important to emphasize that the uh, the causes of the cases uh, remains very much under active investigation. We're looking at a, a range of uh, possible underlying factors, both infectious and non-infectious, that may be causing the cases. 
and these investigations are continuing in both the existing cases as well as new cases from from the countries that have already reported as well as new countries that are beginning to report but but it is helpful to i, I think summarize what we've learned so far um, first, that it uh, it does appear that none of the common viruses that cause acute hepatitis, that is hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and hepatitis E, have been detected in in any of the cases, and and similarly, none of the common bacteria or bugs that cause stomach upsets and gastroenteritis in in children. Um, have also been uh, detected. And then from the questionnaires that have been administered um, across the countries, there doesn't appear to be any clear link to a particular food or a common exposure, um, such as to a, a drug or to, to travel. And, and importantly, there is nothing to suggest a link to the COVID vaccine as the vast majority of, of the children did not receive the COVID vaccine. I think you'll be aware of the reports of a possible link to adenovirus, which is a, a common infection in children as one of the possible hypotheses of an underlying cause. And adenoviruses are a, a group of very common viruses that are spread from person to person, can cause respiratory infections and, and gastrointestinal infections, um, um, uh, particularly in children. And it's been detected in around 74 of those cases that have actually been tested for this. But it is a very unusual, it's unusual for an adenovirus to uh, cause this type of severe symptoms. Um, and so this is what is being actively investigated at the moment. And the importance of systematically testing for all the whole range of both continuing to test of both infectious and non-infectious causes um, and doing this systematically in all the countries and in all the cases. But that is what we know so far based on the 169 cases reported from 12 countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like now to invite uh, the next reporter, Naomi Grimley from the BBC. Naomi, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Thanks for taking this. It's a follow-up follow -up question on hepatitis. Is this sort of leading hypothesis that we're just seeing the cases that we perhaps would have seen previously in years when there were lockdowns emerging? Or is there more of a worry that uh, it, it's something that's, that's sort of emerged dramatically in the last couple of months? Thank you. Um, so it's important to be aware that um, reports of unexplained hepatitis of unknown etiology in, in children, um, the, they occur every year and there are a few reports um, each year. And I think you're right to ask the question of whether we, because we're doing more testing and because alerts have been sent out, we are flushing out and recognizing uh, more cases that have all, all, always existed. And I think uh, we're getting some information from some countries that uh, also do routine surveillance on adenovirus, uh, since I think your, your question particularly relates to that. And in some of the countries that do regular surveillance, there has been an uptick um, uh, in the reports of community transmission of, uh, of adenovirus in other countries, that's not the case, and in some, there is no routine monitoring. Um, so it is simply a signal at the moment, uh, and trying to understand uh, through the planned additional studies, which are looking at, in other settings, what the community rates of adenovirus across all the countries are, um, how we can compare the patients who've been evaluated with, with liver disease um, and adenovirus, compare them to other hospitalized children, whether we're going to see the same rates, and also some more genomic and sequencing studies 
to um, uh, understand whether they are of a common strain with adenovirus, but bearing in mind that uh, less than three quarters of those um, who've been tested have reported adenos. So it is difficult to explain um, as the factor in all cases, if indeed it is um, going to remain as an important uh, hypothesis and cofactor. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, journalists are asking about the title of uh, Philippa. Just let me uh, give you the full title. Philippa Esterbrook is medical expert in the uh, program Global HIV, Hepatitis and STI program at WHO, STI, Sexually Transmitted Infection. So here uh, you go. And now I would like to invite Sarah Neville from FT to ask the next question. Sarah, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please Hello. go ahead. You, you can. Um, it was actually, again, on hepatitis. Um, I was wondering whether there's been quite a lot of speculation that the, this level of disease has emerged because it may have been suppressed during the lockdown. Um, uh, you know, that it really is sort of linked to the lockdowns. I wondered what you thought about that hypothesis. Well, that is certainly, that has certainly been one uh, explanation and interpretation of, of why adenovirus, which normally only causes mild infection, uh, should have resulted in more severe disease. And that as a result of lockdown and uh, suppression or lower levels of transmission of ADNO and perhaps other viruses also, um, and that uh, following release of uh, the, the mask controls and other measures that uh, other susceptible children are now being exposed. I think this is very much a hypothesis. And... Uh, I think we need to systematically work through um, uh, this with the planned investigations uh, in a number of countries looking at this in, in much more detail. So I, I think it is, it is an interesting uh, uh, assessment of the, uh, of, of the data, um, but uh, it, it really needs to be followed up with more investigations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Esther Brook. Um, I would like now uh, to give the floor to our special guest for any closing remark, because uh, we are uh, coming to, to, to uh, an end to our press conference. So let's start maybe with uh, Dr. Seth Berkeley for any closing remark. Um, so thank you, Dr. Tedros, for, for having us here. And on behalf of CEPI, Gavi, UNICEF, and WHO, who are the co-sponsors um, uh, of the um, vaccine pillar of the ACT Accelerator, I think the critical issue here um, is a little bit what we heard in this press conference. Um, uh, Maria talked about this, is how we have to make sure that there is continued political leadership and paying attention to this as a as a as a global problem while there are many others going on um, what we have to do is make sure that we do get very very high vaccine coverage in those at highest risk and that includes not just coverage but those um, um, that require boosters if necessary so that we are prepared um, for potential new variants new wave waves as they come and of course as the science changes we need to be prepared to move with new vaccines if those are necessary or some type of, of routine boosters if those are required uh, going forward. So once again, um, it is an, an, it's been an incredible honor to work with everybody else in the ACT A um, working group on trying to um, uh, uh, make sure that we had tools available for everybody, um, but it's not over yet. And I worry that we're gonna lose that political steam. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Berkeley. Uh, now uh, I, I invite Dr. Philip Juniton for any closing remarks. No, thank you, and thank you, Dr. Tedros, for having us uh, this afternoon. I think the, the point is that uh, we need to recognize that um, 
we may face a new wave and we need to be prepared. And access to medicine will be a key element of the response. We are talking about dozens of million of people to treat, it's not billion, it's different between the vaccine because you need to cover a lot of population, where we are talking about people at risk. So we have the tool now and we need to push to make this available to implement tests to treat in countries. And I think that's the political leadership is absolutely key in that from countries, but also from donors. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Juneton. And now we would like to invite Dr. Rodriguez for any closing remarks. Yes, uh, thank you. And my, my internet's a bit unstable. I hope you can hear me. I just want to reflect on what we heard um, uh, during this press conference, uh, first about the sequencing capacity in Nepal and how they're able to now um, track variants in Nepal, about how critically important testing and surveillance has been for rapid identification of Ebola in, in Western DRC, and how um, important it's been to rapidly respond to a new outbreak of hepatitis to be able to track uh, quickly cases. And I think the lesson there is how critically dependent we are on good testing programs and good surveillance. And what we need to acknowledge is the biggest global threat right now is COVID. And we should apply those same tools and those same lessons COVID until we under this, this press conference has reinforced how critical testing is. And we shouldn't walk away from COVID prematurely while continuing to focus on every other threat that we need to monitor as well. So I just want to make sure that lesson comes through loud and clear. And, and like, like Seth and Philippe, I appreciate the opportunity to reflect on the two years of ACT A. And on behalf of the Global Fund and the WHO and all of our colleagues on the diagnostics pillar, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with everyone today. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. I would like to invite Dr. Uribe for any final comments. Dr. Uribe, you have the floor. Thanks, thanks so much, and thanks so much again to to Dr. Tedros and all that team in Geneva, uh, very briefly, insisting the importance of this uh, further effort in reaching to those who have not yet received vaccines, especially the at-risk groups, and in doing so, also starting to look ahead at the health system strengthening agenda that we have with universal health coverage as an end to it, where we will all come together again, hopefully using all these lessons learned to improve health systems and the well-being, especially of the most vulnerable in the low-income countries. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Uribe. Um, I would like now to hand over to Dr. Tedros for any closing remarks. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Fadila. So I uh, agree with my uh, colleagues. Um, thank you to Seth, uh, Felipe. Uh, Bill and, and Yuan for uh, joining us uh, today and uh, uh, for our partnership and very uh, honored actually to, to work with you. We have a special uh, um, uh, partnership through ACTA. Um, this is actually something that uh, will be a game changer to be honest because for the last two years we have met every week uh, principal level, uh, this level of commitment by all principal heads, those who have joined today and uh, other, uh, other colleagues, heads of other uh, agencies who haven't joined today. Uh, so this is a very good uh, model, to be honest, to serve, um, uh, uh, you know, the world. And um, I would like to use this opportunity for um, uh, your uh, commitment and also uh, leadership. Um, ACTIA has shown us uh, how we can really partner and work work together. Uh, so that's what I would like to uh, highlight. Uh, and then I um, would like to um, thank the uh, press also for, for joining us. And uh, see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>